Hello, everybody. I thought I'd talk today about T. Corona Borealis, the blaze star. This has been all over the media recently, um, and they've been talking about this amazing celestial event where this uh, enormous star is going to flare up in the sky and it'll be absolutely magnificent. Whereas I think we should really perhaps calm down a little bit and have a little look at the truth and what's going on, why are they making these predictions, what's so special about T. Corona Borealis, or T. Corbor, or just TCB uh, for short. So let's start. Well, the uh, star itself is in a strange little constellation that many people have not heard of, called the Northern Crown, Corona Borealis. It's a nice little uh, group of stars, you can usually just see this sort of loop or cup shape to the left of the much more visible larger constellation of Butes, the herdsman in the sky with the bright star Arcturus acting as a good signpost. Now, it's not the right time of year for us here in uh, Cambridge in the UK to see it because it's disappeared down into the twilight. It'll be back in the very, very early morning. Uh, shortly and so uh, we'll have to wait for a better aspect for it to see it in the uh, more civilized evening hours of the night sky. So T Corona Borealis is a relatively obscure star. You can't see it normally with the naked eye. It's the one that's illustrated by the enormously bright one in the picture there but it's not like that at the moment and it, what is it? Well it's a red star. It's a red giant star, in fact, and it's 3000 light years away. So that's quite a long way away. Uh, if you think about it, Betelgeuse, the most obvious red giant that we all know about in the constellation of Orion, that's uh, what, 600 light years away. So this is five times further away. So we get 25 times more reduction in the light five squared is 25 and the square law means that uh, it's going to be correspondingly much much fainter 25 times fainter if it was the same power output so that's pretty faint in fact normally it's 40 times too faint to be able to see with the naked eye so what's all the fuss about well let's go back and have a look about when something interesting was first recognized about this star and it goes back to this guy shown in the uh, drawing there John Bing Birmingham and uh, in 1866 he spotted that TCB had suddenly flared up undergone an outburst and become really bright it had gone from being a telescopic object only uh, down around 10th magnitude all the way up to second magnitude so as bright as most of the bright stars in the sky and blindingly obvious really um, and then it faded away again now 80 years later a young lad not so young anymore he's shown in the picture at the right there this is michael woodman he was 15 years old in 1946 and he saw it do this again um, it suddenly saw this really bright star appear and he reported it to the Royal Astronomer up at Greenwich in London. And uh, this led to it being studied by many scientists. And they realized that it had, in fact, flared up again some 80 years down the road from when uh, it was first seen by John Birmingham back then in 1866. And this is very interesting. So we clearly had what's called a recurrent nova. A nova is a star that explodes outwards and becomes much brighter for a while and then fades back. We usually hear that word in the context of supernova, when a star completely explodes and destroys itself. But these recurrent novas are much less dramatic than that, and they flare up um, and uh, doesn't destroy the star. And so they are able to then calm back down for a while and then perhaps do it again, depending on what it is that's causing the flare up. Well, with these two particular identified outbursts, 80 years apart, 1866, 1946, if you add 80 to that, what number do you get? You get actually, um, you get 20, 26. 
Um, so we're a year early. We're talking about it as being 2025. The media have got hold of the idea and are talking about it happening any time soon. But it could be this year. It could even be next year in 2026 before this happens. Having discovered this recurrent behaviour, though, uh, we can look back in history and see if there were any other reports of it doing so. And if we go all the way back to the year 1217, we find a record. In fact, in 1218, a German monk was looking at the sky and saw that a faint star was suddenly shining with uh, abnormal brightness, it's recorded as. And that's interesting because it, for him to record it as normally faint, it must have been bright enough for him to see at that stage. So that's at least magnitude six. Um, perhaps the skies were very, very clear, maybe a little bit more than that. But we normally think of this star all the way down as magnitude 10. So it was obviously doing something uh, before he identified that it had really flared up. Um, and he recorded that it did so for several days. The abbot, uh, name of Bouchard, the leader of the abbey in Würzburg, recorded it in the Chronicle. And that's why we have the information. He said a wonderful sign was seen. He said the mysterious object in the constellation of Corona Borealis shone with great light for many days. And there's an image there from the Library of Congress. Um, and they have uh, the, the uh, Boutes upside down there and the northern crown drawn to the right of it. So not the aspect we normally see um, with this star marked on there as this extra bright star. We also have a recording of a possible sighting in 1789 by the Reverend Francis Wollaston. Francis Wollaston was a clergyman and an astronomer, and this often went together back in the day. Um, quite a number of uh, famous astronomers were also in the clergy. I guess they had the time to uh, devote to the, the hobby. But Francis Wollaston was taking it very seriously. He built this uh, machine, this contraption that you see on the right here in the drawing there, which was a transit instrument. You can see a telescope mounted in a big wheel uh, in a frame there, and it's only able to move up and down and not able to move side to side. Um, and so he was using this and looking in through the small telescopes at the uh, side of the diagram at the coordinates marked on the big wheel to measure the altitude, the declination above the horizon, uh, below the celestial equator, and create a catalogue of stars. And he was cataloguing stars all the way down to magnitude eight using this instrument. And he marked the position of this T Corona Borealis star. So it must have been undergoing an uh, eruption because he put it in his catalogue and he didn't unfortunately record how bright it was, just recorded the position, but he was only going down to mag eight. So it must have been brighter than that magnitude 10 that we normally uh, think of. Now, things moved on and in the 1940, uh, 1945, 1946 eruption, uh, scientists had learned to study and measure the magnitude of stars on a regular basis, looking for variations and tracking their behavior. And we've got this wonderful chart up at the top right here of the 1946 outburst of uh, TCV. You can see that the magnitude was rumbling along at around about 10. In 1945, it dropped down to about 11. So it lost about a magnitude there about a year prior to it's suddenly going way up off the chart almost there, that great big spike early 1946 going up to magnitude two. So a terrific outburst. And then it came down and then went through um, a sort of post outburst hump back up to eight and then back down towards 10 again. So quite a complicated uh, light curve for the star. Now, of course, that pre-dimming in 1945 is considered to be a signpost that something is about to happen. And we saw the same thing in the light curve in the middle of 2023, which is what's caused all the excitement. There were a number of predictions that this was going to flare up again. 
Um, and those predictions have ranged from early 2024 through to the, the summer and fall of 2024, uh, through to now, to the early part of uh, 2025, as I'm making this recording. Um, and some people are saying, well, actually, it should be next year, 2026. But as I said, the media got hold of this story and it's been all over the place, uh, prompting me to uh, put this video together and talk about it for you. So let's have a look at that, that graph in a little bit more detail there with that pre-eruption dip, the enormous rise in the brightness, the outburst, and then that strange light curve where it uh, has the hump about six months down the road. And it may be that that hump is what some of the observations of those of John Bingham and so on were saying. It's coming up above that eighth magnitude where he was uh, making the measurements. So what's going on? What do we really know about this star? <clears throat> well, when we look at it, it looks red and we can measure the brightness and we can estimate the distance around about 3000 light years. And you can work out whether or not you think it's uh, uh, a small star or a, a large one. And for that brightness at that distance, it must be a red giant star that we're observing. But when you look at the spectrum, there's something interesting about it. Now, what happens with the life cycle of stars is they get born out of a cloud of gas. And depending on how large they are, they take one of a number of different evolutionary routes. They can become a, a small, modest star like the sun, burn for a very long time, converting hydrogen to helium in their cores, turn into a red giant when they run short of that fuel in the core. I think they just have to rebalance the core. Uh, turns into a ball of helium, it shrinks down, uh, you get a shell of hydrogen then with a larger surface area burning around it, and uh, that uh, faster release of radiation forces the star to swell up to a red giant. Eventually, though, it will shed its outer layers, form a planetary nebula. We've got the picture of the so-called Eskimo nebula there, which is a planetary nebula. Uh, the outer layers of the stars have been blown sideways away out into space in these giant, somewhat ragged smoke rings. There's been a number of eruptive episodes. You can see the different shells of gas there. And the little tiny dot in the center is the leftover dead nuclear core of the star, uh, the so-called white dwarf, um, which will remain once the planetary nebula has dissipated into uh, the vacuum of space there. Um, the gases will evaporate. They only last about 50,000 years, these planetary nebulae. So they're quite transient, really, in astronomical terms. Whereas the white dwarf will sit there as the very, very high temperature core of the uh, dead star. It won't be making any new energy by um, fusion at all anymore. It will be just cooling down over eons um, and uh, gradually the color will fade and eventually it will presumably become a black dwarf. We've never seen that. It takes longer than the age of the universe to cool down. For a larger star, you go on the similar journey through a large star burning very quickly, then a red supergiant, similar process of its swelling up, but then it will undergo several stages of nuclear fusion and then perhaps detonate as a supernova when the end comes and it runs out of fuel and the core collapses down either to a neutron star or to a black hole. Now that's very interesting um, and the process takes different lengths of time. The large stars live faster and die younger um, and that's key to understanding what's probably happening with T Corona Borealis. Most stars are born as binary systems. The, the sun is somewhat unusual in being on its own. About 70% of stars are in binary or multiple systems where there's two or more stars orbiting around each other. And inevitably, nature being somewhat ragged as it is, the stars end up being uh, a range of masses. The two partners in the binary will be differently uh, endowed with material. And so they will run at different rates at different temperatures be different colors and they will burn through the fuel and the lifetime will be very different the bigger star will burn through its fuel faster run through to the red giant stage the planetary nebula and the white dwarf or if it's a really massive star detonate but it will do so 
uh, very much faster than the lower mass companion. If we get to the stage where we had two relatively sun-like stars, one of them has gone into the red giant phase, died as a planetary nebula and left a white dwarf behind. And the partner, slightly lower mass, is catching up. It will remain as a main sequence star, burning hydrogen for a long time. Um, but eventually it will swell up as a red giant as well. And it's very interesting. Um, just a, a look back at, at really at that uh, lifetime thing again. The um, diagram shows the different masses, colors and burn rates of stars up the left hand side. The more massive they are, the hotter they burn and they burn disproportionately faster. So they live less time. Time going to the right is in fact in these columns is in steps of a factor of 10. So the biggest blue star at the top left there will only live for 10 million years. Um, oh, sorry, 1 million years, and then will blow up um, in the 10 million year column as a supernova. The, the bluey white stars will live 10 million and then blow up as a supernova. The white stars, three columns, another factor of 10, 100 million. The yellowy white ones, they die as a planetary nebula, but it takes them four columns to, to reach the end, and that's uh, one billion years. Sun-like stars, five columns, and that's 10 billion years. And then the bottom two rows, the orange dwarfs, 100 million, uh, sorry, 100 billion, and the red dwarf stars, one trillion years. Now, those two columns, I haven't put a planetary nebula at the end. That's what we think what they will result in. But those two lifetimes are way longer than the age of the universe anyway. So it's never happened. So this is the idea that big stars live fast and die young. And the bigger they are, the more quickly they will run through. So in our example, we have a sun-like star and perhaps one that's a little more massive. <clears throat> The more massive one evolves very rapidly and becomes a white dwarf star and uh, collapses down. And then it's a slightly lower mass companion swells up to a red dwarf and begin. Uh, sorry, swells up to a red giant star. Getting very confused here. I apologize. Red giant star. Now, the red giant star, the outer layers of it are relatively weakly bound gravitationally. That's why they can puff off their outer layers as planetary nebulae once they reach the, the final stage. So it's beginning this mass loss and letting the material go from the outside. And the white dwarf with its very concentrated uh, mass center there is able to exert quite strong gravity on any material escaping the red giant and pull it across into a spiral, a death spiral, into the white dwarf, falling down onto the center there and uh, being absorbed by the white dwarf. As it does so, the disk of material, the so-called accretion disk, gets very, very hot indeed. And the uh, temperature can rise to the point where it, the disk starts to glow and give off energy before it's absorbed by the white dwarf. But it's also the case that this can be a very uh, lumpy process. And it's those lumps of material going across from the red giant down onto the white dwarf that ca are causing these flare ups in this accretion process. And the interesting thing is exactly why this repeats every 80 years. So it's somewhat surprising that it's been as regular as clockwork. And uh, that's why we're very interested to see whether the predictions of another flare up, uh, at the, which we can study with all the instruments of modern science now, technology having progressed so much since the last time in 1946, we'll be able to see and understand exactly what's going on, what the material is that's causing this flare up and really understand what's going on with the blaze star T Corona Borealis. And I'll stop there. So thank you for listening and uh, do have a look at some of my other videos and uh, subscribe. I don't make any money out of this. Um, I do it for the love of the science and the astronomy. So thanks very much.